So, Karen, tell, tell us why you wanted to do this book and why you wanted to do this book now. Thank you. Well, first of all, just a quick uh, for organizing this event and Jonathan and Sam, who can't be with us tonight, Lindsay and my, my um, fellow with Matt and, and Nima, and then to all of you. My heart is really full tonight seeing so many friends and colleagues with whom I share the road both as a journalist um, and as a human rights and so very much for coming and sharing this evening with us. So I wanted to do this book for a few reasons. The first one has, um, was to really, it was a personal journey as we say in America, um, to try to come to terms with what the hell I saw. Covering last century's bloodiest conflicts on three continents, from El Salvador to Bosnia and then to Africa. Um, it was a, a frenzied pace with which we worked from airport to war, from airport to war. I covered um, probably 15 conflicts. There are nine covered in the book, but, but there, were, there were several others that I covered. And I didn't really have time to look into the faces of the people whose lives um, I was chronicling on the worst, for many of them, the worst day of their lives. So that, that was part of it, and also to do through a few different prisms, because in the decades uh, since I left photojournalism over 20 years ago, I'd become a mother, which is not to say having children, um, uh, sort of that you have a, a monopoly on empathy, but for me, it really helped me understand the gravity of what I had been covering in decades previous. Um, and also, having worked with Human Rights Watch as a researcher and as a policy person, um, I looked at conflict in a different way through these two prisms. So that was the first reason. The second was to add to the historical record on some uh, conflicts which were and continue to be um, grossly undercovered, like the Burundis of this world, for example. Um, but then, as record of, uh, of the role of women in conflict journalism, um, and lastly was, and, and this came into very clear focus, to use a photographic mem um, uh, metaphor, when I was um, editing pictures from the Ethiopian War, the border war in 1998. Um, and I, um, with my Reuters colleagues, documented what was a cluster bomb attack uh, on um, a, the outside of a village in Mekelle. Uh, that was in, in 1998, and fast forward to, I believe it was October uh, um, 2021, and there was a bomb bomb on McKelly. It wasn't with the cluster bomb this time, and the circumstances were different, but I went on Facebook and TikTok to look at some of the images that were being produced through citizen journalism, and they were the same images. They could have taken my pictures, and those taken could have been, it could have been taken 20 years ago. And that was the same where war had once again broken out. So I started thinking a lot about the notion of conflict relapse, of conflicts uh, re recidivism and, and the forever wars, and realizing that, that we uh, as journalists, as policymakers, and perhaps most importantly, the, the governments and the people who are responsible for the protection and promotion of their people are getting something very wrong because it keeps happening again and again and again. So I wanted this book to do more uh, um, than, than present my photographs. Uh, you know, I, I do think photography is important to, to, stop, to stop the noise and just really look into the faces um, of people whose lives have been devastated with war. But I also wanted it to generate some thought on uh, um, how, what is it that we're, we're getting wrong and why is it that these conflicts keep happening. And do you have a thought on that because I think it haunts all of us, certainly all of us who've been covering war as I have for, oh God, um, a long time. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I want, every day I wake up and want to cry because <laughs> how many wars have I covered in Ethiopia? How many wars have I covered in Sudan? How, you know, it's just, so well, give us the answer. Corinne? I would say, you know, wars are different. We have ideological wars and, and good wars and just wars, so it's, it's not all wars. Mm -hmm. But I would say the fraternal wars, um, which are the vast majority, the, the ethnic wars, which usually have, uh, you know, powerful people behind them, of course, for resource exploitation and whatnot. I, I would really say uh, corruption and bad governance, and because it is, uh, I mean, 
in the countries I cover from the day uh, a child is born and the family needs a birth certificate to the day they die and they need a certificate to bury the body. I mean, they, there is money that has to change hands. And, um, and then where security forces, instead of protecting their population from banditry and from, from harm, they are the biggest perpetrators in these countries. And people get fed up. They have no confidence in the state. And they end up rising up against the state or just trying to form a band of, 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 of brothers from their ethnicity who can protect them. So I would say that is one. The other one is early warnings. We, we, you know, I think journalists and and certainly policymakers, but especially policymakers, um, get involved um, too late and they ignore the warning signs when the rot is setting in. And then by the time the cap too late, uh, and then once um, there are a few atrocities which have been perpetrated, that's it. Uh, you know, it becomes this, this endless uh, cycle of reprisals. So I would say early, you know, not enough early, pay, not paying enough attention to early rising, which often doesn't make good news, unfortunately. Um, but also the, it's the countries themselves um, need to be also, I, I think the leverage that countries have because they're paying for a lot of these, uh, these regimes, um, they're paying for them. So stop paying for them. Set really firm conditions so that they cannot um, engage in these kinds of behaviors. But the world has changed. Russia, China, I mean, this is, some people would say this is a very, paternalistic view that you're putting there. Yeah, we are in the middle of a geopolitical realignment, we certainly, are. certainly in, in Africa. But, but in, you know, it's, it's interesting, the, at least with respect to the Sahel, there's a very black and white, one-dimensional um, view that's presented with respect to, you know, the, the Malians and the Indonesia, you know, they want towards Russia and China. But it's actually not true. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. They, are, they were more than happy to work with, with other countries. And America, at least the United States, and a number of other countries were very popular with them. They wanted to continue engaging with them. Um, and there were mistakes made, you know, I think with each country, it's, there's a, a, a different situation. But no, it is true. The Chinas and the, um, and and the Chinas and the Russias are spoilers because they can come in with no conditions. Um, yeah. Now, I, I think the rest of the panelists here, but I'm going to ask you one more question before yeah. they come up, which is, so why did you go from being a news photographer to being a war crimes investigator? Huge career change while the rest of us just kind of maundered on. Right. Yeah, it was quite a pivot. Um, yeah, I would say, well, from a personal point of view, I am, I'm, not, um, I'm not wired to where I got PTSD you know, a few episodes here and there. Um, but but I, I went the other way where I became really de dehumanized. I mean, covering war after war after war, I ended up feeling next to nothing for the people whose lives I was chronicling uh, and cared more about getting a powerful image than it was the people. And at that point, a light off, you know, it was, a, it was an epiphany that I needed to get out because I didn't recognize myself anymore, to be totally honest. Was, I was seeing people one dimensionally. You know, that's part of the process. I mean, with, as a news photographer, because you're there to capture this particular moment at a particular time with no past and no future. And so I wanted to see people in a more nuanced way. And thirdly, I wanted to, you know, the difference between journalism and, and an advocacy group, like the recommendations. Um, you're contextualizing it, but journalists do that as well. But you're coming up with recommendations, policy recommendations on how to um, ensure justice and mitigate some of these abuses. So, so I wanted to be, uh, you know, to have that sort of practical element in my work. We're going to hold that thought. Right. Is it Matt? We've got Matt Poké Big. Uh, have we got Nemo as well? Good heavens. Please um, welcome to the stage, and particularly if they trip over. Um, Matt, come and sit here. Nemo, sit over there, do as you're told. <laughs> right. Sorry, that was my phone, by the way, Lindsay. I'm really sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> so we're now joined. So Matt and Porgy Big, I've probably known as long as I've known Corin. Um, anyway, he has been with Reuters. He's now with the New York Times. He's covered lots of conflicts in Africa. Um, I think, as I said, I think the last time I saw you was in Ukraine. You're, you're kind of pretty much everywhere. Um, here. Hmm. Um, so I've known her for a while. She's, what are you called now? Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent? Uh, no, uh, Chief International Investigative Correspondent. And listening to Corinne talk about how, you know, how do you go from reporting to yeah. investigating so, and documenting? Was, yeah, so for, yeah. With, um, with CNN. 
Um, and I should say, three worked with um, Reuters at one point, and it says something good about Reuters is it produced um, three such exceptional reporters and documenters. So I'm going to pick up that point and, and go to you, Nema, because you do all these investigations now. What is there a difference between journal when it comes and with war crimes and so on? Is there a difference between journalism and documentation, the kind of documentation that Corinne has been doing with, with Human Rights Watch. What do you think? Uh, well, I think that line blurs when you go into investigative journalism because, and I actually had to look this up, I should have known this sooner, but with an investigative piece, you as the journalist are the primary source of information, the same way that for Human Rights Watch or an investigator. So legally, you are stating something. You're not saying that I spoke to so-and-so and they told me this. We are saying, and we have in the past said, this has all the hallmarks of a war crime or this is evidence of an atrocity. So we stay within very, well, we choose to stay within very um, strictly defined parameters, I think, whereas sometimes what I miss about um, hard news just in and of itself is that you can put something out into the world and something, sometimes that's really helpful because then more people come forward and more sources come forward. When we put something out, it has to be within those parameters that allows us to hopefully say the big things we need to say. And what about, and let me come to you, Matt, because the other thing which, which Corinne has raised, which I think is very interesting, is this issue about uh, the recurrence of, of conflicts, which is something I have to say I find fairly um, dispiriting, as I think we all do. Do you think that either as human rights investigators, investigative journalists, or probably you and I are just more kind of, I don't know, bog standard journalists, um, that we... Is there anything that we are doing that, is, that, that may help prevent the recurrence or, or reflects on the recurrence of, of conflict? Yeah, I, I am very much a bog standard journalist. Um, That's not true for either of you, by the way. But. I, I mean, I, I feel like I spend my life trying to report the world as it is mm. with as much nuance and balance and understanding as possible. Um, necessarily give great insights, for example, into the question of how to fix, resolve yeah. conflicts. Um, one of the things that I observe is that sometimes conflicts end when one side gains a decisive military advantage. Huh. And that may not be anything connected to morality, um, but it can be connected to military power. It can be connected to the growing size of one side's economy. Um, one example, and there's probably lots, would be Nagorno-Karabakh. Yes. Where, you know, in 1988, and appears to have now ended a few months ago in September. Why? Because one side got much wealthier than the other side and turned some of that money into... Drones For those who don't know, Nagorno-Karabakh, this enclave, um, which both the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians claimed, and initially back in the late 80s, the Armenians kind of won, as it were, and now in the last year, the Azerbaijanis have come in and basically driven the Armenians out. It was an Armenian, ethnic Armenian enclave within Azerbaijan. Mm. Anyway, now the Azerbaijanis have driven the Armenians and they've won. Mm. So that, that would be one thing. I guess the other kind of thing to say, perhaps on a more <laughs> optimistic note, is that some conflicts do end. Um, and some of the conflicts that you've been involved with, Corinne, are now past tense. Oh, with some of those, it's going to make me happy. Yeah, that's really good. Please. <laughs> come, 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 come. One of the two of you, Matt or Corinne, come up with a conflict that's ended. It's going to make me happy. All right, okay. All right. Well, we've got, uh, well, uh, let's say we've got Sierra Leone in Liberia. Okay, that's um, good okay, but there's not. But I would say that in on, on the other side of that coin would be the, the watching. The levels of corruption are phenomenal in both, um, and you have um, armed actors, including from um, Al Qaeda in the Sahel, that are creeping around. Uh, remember, 9/11 was was in large part um, funded by Sierra Leonean diamonds. Um, so, I, you know, and, and it could become a, a pawn even in the Middle East because of the um, Lebanese presence and certain inclinations of some Lebanese. Anyway, so I would say there's, there's still a cautionary tale there. They're not out of the woods just because there's no conflict. And interestingly, you know, to put the human rights, I, I actually left Human Rights Watch as well, which 
so I can probably say this, but can you also, on the same token, look at, at the El Salvadors of this world, where the levels of violence have plummeted because uh, they're building prisons and putting um, so thousands of suspects <laughs> in prison. And yet, um, now you have fewer Salvadorans making the void. People can go back and people are, even people whose family members are in jail um, support, support what uh, Bukele president, Bukele was just elected as well. So that's an interesting one as well. So what do we think about that? Let's be, so this is the most difficult one. So Bukele, um, the uh, president of El Salvador, just re-elected with a landslide. Um, your human rights watches and your liberal, you know, North London, blah, blah, <laughs> um, people, um, think he's awful. Oh, he's such an awful man. Um, and he swept up lots of people into prison, just like Duterte in the Philippines. And, and um, lots of people, are, the conditions are awful. I mean, they're, you know, they're in bunk beds or bunk yeah. planks, one o'clock, you know, it's just hideous. Um, but people love it because it gets the violence off the streets and it means that they can live. Go on then, Nemo, you deal with that. <laughs> uh, I feel like I got the short end of that thing, <laughs> thinking was the in terms of the geopolitical shift that Corinne was talking about. Part of it is also, I think, that we've had this wave of populism in Europe. We've had Trump in America, and I think there is finally an understanding that this is a human malaise rather than uh, you know a an awful God, aren't they? What did Trump call us? Shithole countries, right? That fundamentally aren't ready for democracy and can't handle democracy. And I think now, when we look when we look at the recidivism of certain countries falling back into conflict. To Corinne's point, that we also have to look at corruption. We also have to look at uh, the weakening of democratic institutions. And if we widen it in that way and we just view it as something that has happened, to, then I think you can start to understand it a little bit better. I mean, look at the US. We always used to say in Sudan that democratic institutions are only as strong as the will of the people who protect them. And we were always told, and I, I went to university here, I, very North London, I went to the London School of Economics, and there were all these conversations about you know, where you are in the lifetime of democracy, in the lifetime of a, of a country. But the US, which was considered one of the key democracies in the world, is, is having to really think about how it shores up its, its institutions. So I think that you, you have to want, be willing internally there. Right? What is it that you have contributed? And I know in Sudan, I have these conversations with family and friends all the time. What is it about the way that those of us who are from the center and who are more privileged, what is it about the tribal system? Uh, why did we need an earthquake? But I don't see so much of that kind of... But, I mean, there's two issues. There's the recidivism and there's the, the issue of, of, of populism and these, and these very harsh measures, which are very popular in some countries, but before because you've taken us on to Sudan, so let's go there. So you're from Sudan. The first, the first reporting I ever remember you doing was from Darfur 20 years ago when you reported the genocide in Darfur. You very bravely went there when others didn't go, when foreigners couldn't go, when I think your own bosses told you not to go. And you, At Royce's, yes. Yes, they did. But you went anyway. And you, you were one of the main people uncovering the massacres in Darfur. And now they're happening again, because the you reported on then are now the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, and it's all happening again. So to come back to Corinne's point, what, what has happened that this can be repeated? Well, but I think, that, I think Sudan is the perfect example, because it's twofold, right? So, I mean, it's Cold War 2.0. Sudan, Egypt, Syria, Libya were, were a huge part of Russia's push into Africa in the first Cold War. Yeah. And post the Ukraine, even before the Ukraine war, they were, they were the gateway into Africa for Russia. From 2017, Sudanese journalists were risking their lives to say they are exploiting our gold, they're exploiting our resources, and the US and Europe and the UK did nothing. So you have the same twofold issue there, where you have a geopolitical issue playing out locally. Uh, Western nations very hypocritically choosing to look away when it comes to Africa, looking but involving. But then also we have the fact that when Himed Di, the, the head of the RSF, whose, whose forces were implicated in the genocide 20 years ago, when he came to Khartoum, many of the Sudanese said, fine. Because he didn't kill us in the center. He killed the Darfur. 
stories out there have to talk about that responsibility that we bear for this earthquake. I mean, and when I say this earthquake, there isn't a single Sudanese. Nothing protected anyone. No money, no influence. People were trying to flood across that border into Egypt. And because Russia was heading the Security Council, Sudan was not declared an emergency to let the Sudanese in. But again, what is the complicity of the world? The US, I mean, we did a whole... There's no such thing as the world. Let me come on to, to Corinne here, because Corinne, you... The multilateral global institutions. What is yes. the global let me come institutional... On to, to, let me put this one to Corinne, because cause you've, you've talked about the responsibility, particularly, I think, of the Americans, and, and you are uh, um, American yourself. So on, Sudan is your classic um, recidivist conflict. Where do you see responsibility lying? Except, I mean, Nema, as a Sudanese can talk about the responsibility of, of Sudanese, fine. Where do you see the responsibility outside of Sudan? Yeah, I would say, and I don't know Sudan well, so, so please forgive me on that one. I knew it better 20 years ago. It but hasn't I, changed. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, to the point, yeah, right. But I, I mean, I would, I would look at the leverage. Is, do, does the international community actually really use its leverage mm -hmm. enough? And, and when there's a new country, as there was in, in South Sudan, for example, I know the, the war that we're talking about is in the north, but when there's a new country, when there's a new regime, even sometimes when there's a coup, and the, it's not, it presents an opportunity to the, the international community to draw a line in the sand and, and very unsatisfyingly to say, okay, we're going to forget about some of these, you know, these crimes and corruption that happened in the back. That's not the perfect example, but often you know, political life is just not going to go forward without it. It's a, it's a real politic one. And then condition every single penny that those countries get on an anti-corruption commission with the power of indictment. Agree. Never mind. No, but what the they hell? can still be, no, I mean, they can, it, I don't think we've gotten to that point where they're starving yet, but for the money, these countries mm -hmm. depend on foreign aid and foreign investment, and if the leverage is used in a proper way, at the same time supporting all the other governance institutions, and you know, the one people, um, and the parliaments are hugely important. They are that third arm of government, and often, you know, we know they're corrupted, but they are supposed to be mandated too. Um, to represent the people. But anyway, um, I would say that would be one, at least, again, in the countries that I cover in West Africa where, um, and, and elsewhere in Africa, where, where corruption is the driving force behind undermining the confidence in the state and um, that pushes young men, in, A, across borders uh, to migrate, and B, you know, into armed groups. But are you Matt. saying that corruption is the issue or international focus on corruption? No, corruption by civil servants and all the way up to the top in national governments. And then also turning a blind eye to it because there's a lot of that going on too. Um, you know, I'll give you an example, Mali, which of course, um, you know, after its spectacular collapse in 202 in 213, where you had a coup in the south and then Al-Qaeda and the Tuareg separatists took over the north. And then, um, and you had, you had a and peacekeeping mission, a Euro, um, um, military intervention, you had bilateral, so much goodwill went into that country. And unfortunately, the Malians ended up stealing a lot of money. There were scandals with a, with a presidential airplane. There were scandals where, um, with the military budget. And, and the, the World Bank got a bit annoyed and they, I don't know, maybe it was six months or eight months. Um, and, and they demanded that there was one little change that was made in the procurement strategy. Instead of conditioning that aid, which Mali desperately needed, on accountability and again on some sort of commission, some sort of judicial mechanism to address to address corruption. Uh, At least yeah. that, I, I hate to harp on that, but I think it's... No, it's, it's, it's fair, you know, it's, when you look it's at fair enough. And I'm, I'm going to put I mean, that to you. So, Mark, I have to tell you something, which is that... so. At the end of so the beginning of every year, I do a thing for Channel 4 News, which is my sort of, you know, what is going to happen in the year ahead. And I remember at the beginning of 2013, I decided I'd have a big thought. And my big thought was Western intervention is over. And the first story I did was the French intervention in Mali, which just goes to show how little I know. But a lot of people in West Africa, and I've just been in Niger, would say, well, hang on, bloody French colonialists. Um, coming in and telling us what to do, they could But also off. French companies benefiting from a lot of this corruption. So let's not, I mean, I know that's not what you're saying. Yeah, but, but go ahead. But it's also, 
you have to, someone has to corrupt these officials, right? And so a lot of these governments that are also saying, well, we won't give you aid unless you meet these caveats and these metrics around anti-corruption. plane was made in, an, uh, you know, in a European capital and it's leather lined interior. So they're also not controlling their companies that are making money and providing uh, um, the Cameroonian dictator. You, he, st yeah. he still takes out, what is it, the whole hotel in the south of France? So they also continue to, I, I keep saying France, but it's not just pr France, I promise no, you. No, but France is a very good example because it's so clear. Matt, you want to say something? No, 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 I mean, the French example, particularly with respect to Ivory Coast, is a, is a complicated one in that French investment in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s coast to become much more prosperous than any of its neighbors and a magnet for immigration as a result, um, which then went on to you know, have very complicated consequences for the country, but it's not, it wasn't all an, a negative thing. Um, and Ivorian certainly would have I mean, did look down their noses at all the surrounding countries because they didn't have perfect roads and they didn't have street lamps in villages and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was largely a function of, or to, to a large extent, a function of French investment. Um, I remember that when Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was elected the first female president of Africa, I'm forgetting the year now, and she went to China when the Chinese investment was, um, was you know, there was a lot of focus on the Chinese investment, Belt and Road and so on. So she was invited to a Chinese Africa summit, and people came down on her and criticized her. Why are you, uh, you know, apparently you should be ending this relationship and this exploitation? And she said to people, "Look, who signs the contracts? It's not the Chinese. It's we who sign the contracts. We, African finance ministers, development ministers, parliaments, who should be signing off on them. The Chinese." could be the biggest boon to it properly and if we manage it. So I think that's also really important as well, is not to infantilize government. Like, yes, the, and, and we know, like, yes, these companies come in and of course they're going to optimize their profit, but ultimately these are countries and it's their country and their resources and their responsibility to manage how they're spent. So in other words, what I'm saying is there really is blame all around. Yes, um, absolutely. You know, and with the French, it's interesting because I, you know, I, I mean, I, I sort of documented war crimes in the Sahel for many, many years from the ground up, from the villages up, and, and, and I think the anti-French thing was also manipulated by the political elite who stand to gain from this. Like, the people on the ground actually liked them. They, when they detained them, they didn't execute them. Um, they, they managed the, um, the, you know, they managed the counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. They were successful in certain areas. So, and they made a lot of mistakes with respect to the counterterrorism, which is why they were. Yeah, killed. and also, when, I mean, when I was in Niger, you know, in November, I had you know, interesting conversations with guys who, uh, who, very interestingly, actually, they liked the Americans and not the French because they said they were French were a bunch of patronizing gits, and the Americans. Interestingly, a lot of the Americans were African Americans, which they liked, and they also said the Americans were a lot more respectful than the French. The French were, I mean, sorry, how many French people have we got here? <laughs> but the French were a bit French, you know, and they felt they they felt that colonial that post colonial thing. It was a big it was a big deal. And interestingly, after the coup in Niger um, late last year, um, the post coup government, which is not not the greatest people that kicked out the French, but they have not kicked out the Americans. The Americans still have their base in, in Agadez. So a lot of this is about attitude and approach yeah. and, and respect, because respect uh, and is a post-colonial legacy, right? Yeah, and post-colonial legacy, definitely. But I suppose what I suppose what what is slightly concerning me about what you're saying um, is whether is how you balance that issue of accountability with respect because we are in a post-colonial period we're not in a period where the white guy goes and says if you don't do where i want it you know well i don't know i i'd push back on that because look at Get what it. the late prigozhin did you know as as he and now um putin and the africa corps are are spreading their wings uh and transposing onto africa their model of governance and we know where that ends up um, which, which is sort of worse than colonialism, but it kind of looks has a lot in common with that. So they've just they're just different people that are colonizing Africa. It's just 
it's just different. But I see different kind of Matt. Th this yeah. is a this is a non-Africa anecdote, but it speaks to the question. I lived in and worked in Indonesia for for a while, and um, my time there, I went to to listen to the foreign minister, who every year in January gives this big speech about. Indonesia's coming foreign policy for the year. And I spent a lot of time in Africa, so I kind of went there thinking, okay, he's going to be talking about his relationships with, you know, Europe and his relationships with... And he got through this whole speech. It was like a one-hour speech without mentioning uh, Europe and with very little reference to America. The whole speech was about the relationships with India and China because Except they're the big trading partners. And Indonesia's very interesting levels, but one is, with respect to this dialogue, that they base their foreign policy on trying to balance competing interests. And they've got the economic might to do that. And they don't want to be beholden to effectively one side or the other. Um, something that one can learn from, or that states can learn from. Yeah, no, and, and there's a merit to that. So before I open up to questions, let me just come back to, to what we do which is journalism and documentation. So these, these are very complex issues. And surprisingly, in the last 45 minutes, we haven't come up with the answers. Um, <laughs> shit. We're just not trying, are we? But what impact? So tell me, Nemo, let me, let me come to you. So, Because I know that a couple of your investigations have had a real-world impact. Tell me a bit about investigations that have had a real-world impact that you have done. Um, well, the Russia-Sudan gold investigation where tell, we... Tell us what that was. Okay, so it, it goes to that issue that I was talking about that Putin had put in place the circumnavigation of the sanctions um, post the annexation of Crimea. So it wasn't like Europe or America weren't already aware of the stakes here. So from 2017, he signed a deal to exploit Sudanese gold. And it continued even after the US sanctioned one of the entities they were using. And we got in and, um, and in fact, it was one of the things we discovered that had derailed the democratic transition in Sudan because the anti-corruption task force said, no, you can't just change the name of this sanctioned company, Meadowy Gold, into another name. Uh, that's not how democracy usually works. So the generals, among other things, but the generals then overthrew the civilian leadership because Prigozhin, wanted it because he because Meroe Gold was so lucrative for them as a pipeline into the war in Ukraine and we we got we because what we do is we then we're very specific and because I'm Sudanese for me I don't really care I, I mean obviously I do but the focus for me isn't that much on the bad actors that we know of, like the RSF, right, like the Sudanese generals. It's on the hypocrisies and the lack of the US and Europe fulfilling their own legal systems obligations. So we went through and we usually, we'll, we'll pick the statute, right, that's being violated. So we went through and we said, seems to be a, a very obvious case of cer sanctions circumnavigation here while you're looking the other way. And it, it ended up in the sanctions regime expanding in the US, the UK, there was a report here which essentially amounted to, in the British Parliament, um, you know, these idiots from CNN could figure it out. Why couldn't the British government? Which I felt was Funny a bit that. harsh. Yeah, no, I felt it was a bit harsh. Um, but I think it's because we are very specific and I also think it's because, and we see this now with Israel Gaza, right? I think we're now very, very sensitive to the ways that that we in the West, and I, I guess I'll kind of consider myself straddling both, do not meet our own standards, do not uh, you know, abide by our own legal statutes when we deal with these countries. And that really, I think, has become the kind of the fulcrum for this. Well, why are you applying human rights law here, but you're not applying it here? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Corin, where, where, where are you with that? I mean, uh, respond to them, but if you want to, but also, you know, in your photography, in your, um, in your human rights research, what happens? Yeah, and obviously every country is different. You know, sometimes taking out a bad actor, like uh, just going back to Sierra Leone, Liberia, the special court for Sierra Leone was a real, that, that took out Charles Taylor. I mean, that neutralized Charles Taylor. And, and if it's anything, uh, uh, 
um, uh, you know, one of the most of the use of power is that is that one man, and sometimes one woman, but it's usually one man can can bring down a whole country. And in the case of Charles Taylor, it was sort of the whole region. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 look at Angola as well when he died. I mean, so so taking out one man uh, really made a difference because he was he concentrated. Power. Vladimir, so he's just walking. Oh, How nice to see you. Sorry, go yeah, on. Yeah, so, so that's one, you know, and that is, that is one of the, the key factors that led to stability in, um, in the Mono River Union, Sierra Leone, and, and, and Liberia. So that is one thing, justice, but, uh, you know, not everywhere, uh, because there have been, you know, the, the, the number of war crimes um, perpetrated. Um, I, I mean, sorry, but it makes everywhere else in the world just pale in comparison, and it doesn't get enough attention. We're back to describing Ooh. problems anyway. But no, seriously, I mean. Ooh. Seriously. Speaking as somebody who's been in Ukraine and mm. speaking as somebody who's covering Gaza every day at the moment, well, I'm... I mean, I, when I uh, did the research for what was called the Mora Massacre, which is where the Malians and the and then Wagner, now the Africa Corps, uh, when I did the research, I said it was 300 people that they'd mm. summarily killed. At the same time that Bucha, at that time, there were six I know it went up a lot, um, but then later saying it was 500 that were killed. I mean, that was just in one day. I mean, when I left Human Rights Watch, I actually, as an exercise, I went back and I added up the number of some summary unlawful executions, not to the, to the person, uh, each of whom has a name and a family behind them in a community, and, and it was pushing 10,000. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, from, it's, I mean, it's great. And, and, I no can, and to finish that, I can count on two hands the number of incidents for which there have been justice, the number of people who've been tried and convicted. Hmm. I mean, and, and you look at, for example, in America, the, the seismic change that the killing of George Floyd happened, which is important. Yeah. On, on, Absolutely. And then you look at Africa, and you think Africans are any different? But, you know, when no, but I think that the, I always have a problem with numbers because numbers are always bigger in Asia because there's more people in Asia. So I always think it's a bit difficult because, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, Partition. I can't remember how many people were killed in partition. Maybe somebody here can help me. What happens in China? You know, it's always larger numbers in Asia than anywhere else. And so I feel that that doesn't, numbers yeah. aren't really. But that doesn't matter, Lindsay, because for behind every family, behind every death is a potential recruit for a jihadist group or, or a criminal gang because they're seeing their, I mean, frankly, I hate to say it, but but um, a good number, if not the majority, were the security forces who were mandated to protect their population. Absolutely. So, yeah. so anyway. let me come back to one thing, another thing with you, Corinne. So, no, I mean, so the work you do as a human rights investigator is extraordinary. It's very meticulous. It's, it's as you say, it's person by person. And I've, I read your reports, and I know the care you put into it, and I know, you know, that you, you get the testimonies, and then you talk to the family members and so on. But there's an emotional impact that your pictures have that your reports don't have. So where does that fit in? What is the emotional impact that these pictures that we were looking at earlier have? Yeah. No, I think, I, I, I think it's incredibly important for, for pictures and other forms of media to always be in combination because we know that pictures can be manipulated. They have to be situated within a context, and that context is um, words, whether they're in, in television or radio or, or print. Um, but I think it's a combination that happens to move, to move people. It's a combination of the heart and the, and, 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 and the head. Um, and pictures allow you to look straight into the faces of people whose, mm. whose lives, uh, you know, whose, you take that picture, are entering uh, a labyrinth of grief from which they'll never emerge. Um, and, and also, it's not just, the, as you'll see in the book, it's not just pictures of people who are grieving, but also the joy and the hope of people when there's been a regime change, which is unfortunately squashed later. But also of young so excited to be learning, to be picking up a gun, you know, at the age of, um, you know, 14, 15, that they see war as the, the most promising opportunity for them. You know, that's an indictment, is it not? It, their, it is, but, it's, yeah. but you see it in so, the picture in a way yeah. that, no, I, yeah. I think that that's very good. So another thing, again, before we open up, one of the things that's bothering, interesting me at the moment is this whole issue of where we as journalists and human rights investigators can get to. There are five places I want to be in at the moment, oh, six if we include Conduit Club. Um, <laughs> but the, the other five are Gaza, Russia, 
Russia, Sudan, on. I can't go to any of them. One, because I'm personally banned, and the others because everybody's banned. And yet we see this cohort of, um, if I can call them indigenous reporters, and Gaza is the most extraordinary example. You know, in Gaza, the, the, journal, the Gazan journalists have been doing, and I don't know if you want to speak to this, Nema, is, is just phenomenal. A hundred of them have been killed. Now, we, I mean, Nema, I'm... We're now going to stop for a small advertising break. Um, Nema is a mentor for the Marie Colvin Journalist Network, yeah. which, is, um, which was founded in Marie's memory by Lise Doucette, Jane Wellesley, and myself, where we support young female, gen- young women journalists across the Arab world. And we have eight members in Gaza, and every day I wake up worrying about them. But, I mean, Nema, can you just talk a little bit about how things have changed in the sense that it's not just us foreign correspondents, but... How, what, what difference does it make when you have the Gazan journalists or the Sudanese yeah. journalists? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also important to point out that in both Gaza and Sudan, because we always think of citizen journalists indigenously, but these were professional journalists, yeah. a lot of them. Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, um, a lot of kind of... And so I, I think what, when the Ukraine war happened and we kind of, us lot on TV especially, we kind of reverted back to the old school and the press and the, you know, th- there is a certain theater to it, right? And it felt like, oh, we, you know, we're back there in the Iraq war. But actually now when you look years ago, you see this extraordinary shift that's happened, right? We saw it in Sudan with the Sudanese journalists showing the world an image that I think people wouldn't have associated with somewhere like Sudan. This non-violent, joyful, people turning up with sound systems at the demonstrations while they were being sprayed with tear gas. Demonstrations led by women, a revolution led by women. And I think Sudan kind of started what Gaza finished, which is the ability of the journalists in situ to humanize themselves and their context in ways that I think often by the time we get there, I mean, you know, you, Lise Desette, Christian Amanpour, Jeremy Bowen, these are people to get into everywhere. But Thank you, dear. Thank you. I have no pull with the Iranian government, Chris. But, you know, if, if I could, the authority and the experience that you bring and the kind of the contextualization of the arc of all of these narratives across the kind of the changes that we're seeing globally. But then you also do have far too much of the show and tell where people turn up in the flat jackets and the helmets and they point at things and they don't contextualize them in the way that someone who lives in that context can and does, and I think, especially with the Palestinians, I don't think that, I, this was my first time in Israel and Palestine. And of course, when you read the two systems of law and the military occupation, that's very different than turning up as a, a dark-skinned Afro-Arab Muslim woman. And at every point, I was treated in a matter of institutional racism in a way that I have never experienced anywhere else in the world. I was separated. I was separated from the white members of my own team, right up until the point that we were leaving Tel Aviv Airport, where my producer, who was terrifying, so fair, they let her through first, and she just, you know, swiped her boarding pass, and I naively swiped alongside her. But of course, no, I need permission to leave the state of Israel, and I have a British passport, and she has a Canadian passport. So I think those are things that, because we have too little diversity, often people aren't reflecting that to the audience. But what the Palestinians did after 9-11, where so many brown people and Muslims were contextualized as terrorists, is they told their story in a way that we couldn't. We couldn't. I think that's really important. Matt, um, you and I... Yeah. Were you shocked by, by the fact saying. that I was not, you know, all, saying, not allowed to leave? You would have thought they'd want me out, right? No, they were like, no, you stay. <laughs> Why? But Matt, Sorry, you Matt. foreign correspondent, um, human rights investigator who comes in from the outside. Do you, do you think that's an old model or do you think there's a, still a role for it? I, I mean, there's huge problems with it and maybe the stage that we're at is trying to recognise some of those problems. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly with respect to Africa, there is a real movement, I think particularly in East Africa, of written correspondence, in quotes, uh, because of decades of misrepresentation of only focusing on stories about conflict, for example, or disease, or Mm. poverty, or corruption, and of failing to correctly 
understand and tell the real stories that are at the center of the gravity of the continent. Mm. So is there a role for international people coming in? I would say, of course, but I would also say, you know, that should include uh, Kenyans going to Beijing and yes. going to Ukraine, right? Yeah. Um, foreign shouldn't mean your center of gravity has to be London or New York. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Corinne, where are you on all that? Yeah, I would, I would well, add on to and agree with, with all the points made. And um, I think of concern with local reporters are, are A, the blind of things that are just so habitual they don't see them as being a problem. Like trafficking, for example, in, in Africa, sometimes you know, the most extraordinarily disturbing stories of trafficking, and it's just, it happens so it, often. It happens so often that people it's think so it's that normal. Just think it's takes normal. takes somebody yeah, from outside I mean, to come in and go, yeah. that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in well as, as 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 well, and when I was with HRW, we had this this discussion a lot. The fear, like the 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 the, the um, danger that not just they but their their families encounter. If this they this is a huge if thing. They report thing, yeah. and and so um, and so often, um, you know, it was in. It was a dynamic within where there was there was an a, a, an important um, push to diversify for sure, um, but then. Um, some of the local actors were too afraid to report, and you had people on the ground saying, "We don't care what color you are. Just please, please take our testimony and get our story out yeah. because, because we can't leave." Yeah. So again, I think there's um, um, to be struck, and the people have to. Okay, let me open it up for for questions. Can, can I, Vera, sorry, do you want to say something? I'd happened? like to ask Corinne a question. It doesn't have to be now. Yeah, no, that's, go, go ahead. Point. You can share the rest so of the session if you'd like. Go ahead. No, so this is a question which really takes it back to you, Corinne. Um, you, as a, as a journalist, you had a reputation um, for extraordinary bravery. Yeah, this is true. Um, writers tend to be in awe of, of, of visuals journalists for the risks that they take. But other photographers covering conflicts were in awe of you, you for the risk. Of. And I kind of wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, why you took those kinds of risks, but also when you look back. Yeah. It's a good question. When you look back, do you feel differently about the times at which you thought, I probably won't see the sunset kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. well, um, yeah, it's true. I, I, um, she was crazy. Yeah, a little crazy. She yeah, was. There were yeah, well, we were yeah. on a few of those, like in Burundi. There remember, were two where we sources got, on yeah. her being crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right, yeah. No, I mean, I would say uh, anyone who, who correspondent knows, like, there, it's a special type of psychology, sorry. Like, it's just a special psychology when you Why get that close. Why are you looking at close. me? This no, is sorry, you but it's like, I should be looking at <laughs> And back. Lindsay, we did, actually. <laughs> we did some of these. It's a special, you know, I'm not going to say there's a death witch there, but there's a, there's a certain bit, shall we say? And it was funny, because I was wounded at once. I, I, I did, uh, with two other Reuters correspondents, go over, a, no. One, one um, Reuters and one UPI. We went over a landmine. We were in an armored car. And, and Where was that? In Bosnia, yeah. It was an armored car, which is why I'm here to, to, um, to speak about it. But the, the odd thing was is that, is that after I, I was better, then they sent me to Somalia. They said, it's a really nice, quiet story. It's just <laughs> starving children, so go ahead. And I said, okay. So I got there, and of course, then it erupted into you know, what ended up being Black Hawk Down. But anyway... Um, so that was a bit crazy, but but I would say the weird thing is after I was wounded and and there were a few other times as well with, where it was milder, but I ended up being emboldened by it and say, oh I, well I survived that, you know I can survive the next one. But I, you know frankly when when one goes into these situations, it's not um, it's after a pretty careful consideration. So there is um, you know like. But I think that the entry is just the, and this builds on what Matt's question is that you you said quite near the beginning that you you knew you suffered from PTSD. And therefore, you dealt with it different, which is actually rather, which is kind of brave in its own way. Yeah, yeah it was. When I looked, I kind of left at the top of my game, and I just had a, a, an epiphany after a particular incident that I write about in the book, and it was just like a light switch went off, and I said, I'm just, I'm getting out. And I didn't look back, and, um, but, ho you know, hold photojournalists so dear and think that the contribution that they're making, it, you, you know, not looking at these pictures, I think, is really a form of disinformation. Uh, you know, we, mm -hmm. that's an argument in, in America with respect to gun violence. You know, not seeing those pictures is disinformation. I, they don't have to be the bloodiest ones of children, you know, that are, that are, that are 
riddled with bullets, but seeing pictures too. To well, you know, of the pictures that we saw earlier, one which I think was from El Salvador, which sticks with me, is the people who are looking at what is clearly a body. And you can see the someone's got their, you know, their T-shirt over here and somebody's doing this. And you, can see, you can't see what they're looking at. Yeah but you know what they're looking at. And I thought that was such a powerful photograph. Yeah, that was one of the pictures I was going to talk about, if we had time for that. That was an exhumation. I mean, can one think of, of more horrible things, of seeing your loved one exhumed after you know, mm. being killed by a death squad? Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have 15 minutes. Um, do you have any questions? Nino's. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a microphone coming round, and apologies if I know people's names but I do. I just wanted to get back to that little distinction. Matt said she did crazy things, but I don't think that Corinne thinks the things maybe. Mm. So what were the considerations like when you'd go into, we haven't talked so much actually about that book yeah. and the picture showed there. So what were the considerations? That, because I think you didn't think that you were crazy. Well, part of it, yeah, there were a few crazy moments there, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, I think nobody, nobody thinks they're going to die the day they die. I mean, you know, so, so I did some, I took a lot of risks because, um, A, I was phenomenally competitive. So, you know, like that has to be said that that's one of the drivers from a personal point of view. Wanting to do, do well by the agency. Um, wanting to, and, and, and also, of course, wanting to tell the story. I mean, the pictures of the inter Ahamway, you know, I was like riding around with the inter Ahamway in the middle of the genocide. But I, cal it was calculated. I thought about it, what was going to be my approach. So I knew that, you know, it was, it was, it was calculated and it was, um, so, but anyway, yeah, I mean, there, it, look, it's, our, it's the job of a journalist. It was my job then to tell the story visually and you've got to be there. And you've got to be close. And you've got to be close. I mean, that's, that's our job. That was our job. That is now your, continu you know, continues mm. to be your job. So um, that's the reason for the, for the team, to go in and, and get those pictures. But it's done with more, and certainly now, with the security advisors. Back in the day, we didn't have security advisors. We just kind of called Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan, can we go in the car? And we're like, yeah, sure. Um, so, but we took, oh, my God, Matt. Like, Matt and I wouldn't have been here. We went in covering. Brun, do you remember covering uh, ethnic cleansing? And sometimes it's just your gut feeling. We, we were going out to cover an ethnic cleansing incident in um, uh, Bougenbeur Royal, and we saw these soldiers sort of along the side of the road. And then we remember we just had the worst feeling, and we said, like, no, something is wrong about this mm -hmm. incident. We turned around, and they were in the process of setting an ambush, blamed the other side. I mean, we, we, that was close. So I Sometimes think it, your instinct it, yeah, is all you, you have. To, and, and when I went over the landmine, I, you know, my instinct said, don't go down that road, and I did. So that was really dumb. Yeah, so you have to, you have to follow your instinct. Uh, yes, go, go, yes go, go ahead, Nina. Yeah. Just thinking about like, the, the citizen uh, journalism that we see in, in, mm. in Gaza and in Ukraine. No, we're not seeing citizen well, journalism in Gaza. Saying, we're seeing journalism in Journalism, Gaza. exactly. Um, how do you, do you feel that from the times when you were active in photography, and, and this maybe is a question that goes to all of you, how has that affected like the, now the international journalist sort of actions or what you'd cover or not cover? I don't know, maybe you can elaborate. Well, I mean, I think that some of that is about what, yeah. what I was saying, which is that the places I want to get to I'm banned from, so, or we yes. are all banned from, so you can't get a view. Yeah. So it's partly, it's also a question of an understanding that sometimes people who, who live there have a, you know, can do it better than we can. You know, it's, it's a mixture of, of both of those things. Nemo, Nemo, where are you on that? Well, I think because I, I was a local journalist in Sudan and I'm very aware that I took, if an international journalist had taken them, it, it probably wouldn't have been, uh, it wouldn't have been as huge a risk, right? Because my family were there. Um, I was detained, I was never detained in Khartoum, but when, when I was out in Darfur, I was much more kind of, it was, it was much more kind of open season. But I, I do think that there are some foreign people telling their own stories. And, um, you know, to both Corinne and Lindsay's point, that you have to give people agency. If they, for them, it, if, as it was for me, it's existential. It's about nation building. It's about the job of a journalist in a very real way. And we have to allow people, and you know, as Lindsay 
then sometimes no go. We, we can't give them the cover that we should be giving them, but what we should be doing from here is advocating for them. I, we don't hear enough, and Lindsay just said it, that the Israeli government is refusing to allow journalists in unaccompanied. I think my colleague was the only person who got in briefly with the Emiratis for about two hours. When, it, when that was Bashar al-Assad in Syria, everyone was saying, was talking about it. And I, I think that's what we should be doing more for these journalists and not thinking about it as local versus international, but just about the fact that how can we come together to tell the story and what's yeah. our responsibility yeah. to that? Is that the point where you say something about the Marie Colvin Journalist Network? Yes, sorry. Um, not advertising, break, but very important to say, if only there was an organization that advocated and right. trained and Lindsay was involved with. But no, seriously, I mean, the Marie Colvin Journalism Network, there was this amazing journalist um, that I spoke to, a uh, young woman in Yemen. And you wouldn't have thought that many the women Yemeni doing journalists, that. The Yemeni journalists, the women are unbelievable. I mean, they're terrifying. She was terrifying. I was just like, do you, do you want to say that? And she was like, yes. I was like, okay, fine. You go ahead and say that. And then really briefly, I think the other, the other important um, character or protagonist in this are editors. And everybody yes. needs an editor. Everybody needs an editor. This is true. Everyone. And it's the editors um, who can help correct some of the implicit bias. Yeah. And, and Wait, which all of us have. Which it's all not, of us have, yes. It's not just the Gazan journalists in Gaza who has an implicit bias. I may have an implicit bias. You, all of us, you know, none of us are, um, are immune from this. But also sometimes, especially in intentionally been suppressed, right? Like Sudan or Yemen or Syria. Sometimes it's not that they're not extraordinary journalists, but it's just simple things like, well, you have to put in for a right to reply. And they're like, why? He's a genocidal maniac. It's like, <laughs> right, yeah, but, you know, we, we still have to, like, these are the kind of the parameters of our... It is just the mentorship is just around those things. Yeah, yeah what's a little bit more worrying is the citizen journalists that are not journalists. Yes, yeah, and, then, and then and then you have a, that's a, but there, there's a slidey, there's a lot of slidey stuff here. Okay, more questions. Does anybody else, there's a lady at the front here has a question. Um, I'm sorry. No, she's, uh, I would have taken it either way. Yeah. Um, you know, I've always thought that um, I am a photojournalist and uh, is a more post-conflict, but the thing that I'm thinking about is what can be published today? You know, photographs are definitely forensic evidence of what's happening. But at the end, it's told by The Guardian, they couldn't publish pictures about girls that were raped, basically because they were under the age of 18. And that there is this kind of uh, 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 sanitation. Sanitization is such a good, such a good question. And, yeah. and I'm just wondering, you know, looking at what's happening today in the 2024, how much we can't see properly can't, because uh, it can't be published. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Corinne, has it changed? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it has. Well, there are a couple, a couple factors that, that feed into it with all these trigger warnings. You know, I think, every, I, think um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I just don't think people are that fragile that there has to be a trigger warning for everything. I mean, if it's a beast, that probably shouldn't be on. Or there shouldn't be images or video of that for sure. But um, I think there's a certain... Um, a, a, I don't want to say over-concentration to sort of psychological fragility, but... I just said it, so there it is. Um, and, but on the other hand, um, you know, again, part of the problem is when pictures just go out on TikTok and on, and on um, social media, and there's, and there's, you know, again, they're not edited, you know, like, oh my God. There's no stuff. context. Well, there's no context. They can be manipulated. They could be being sent out by people who have an agenda. Um, and sometimes they're way too graphic. They're just certain things. There are limits in there. But I think sometimes, and then one of the other limits is a sense of ownership of who has the right to represent a particular country or a particular issue, which I, which I, I, I think is misguided. Because again, I go, I, I'm on in Matt's camp, like let's have journalists who, you know, who happen to be of a particular ethnicity or persuasion to photograph someplace else. Like, it, it, you know, nobody the, on, on the, um, the art of, or the, you know, the profession of photojournalism. Um, the idea is to open it up and make, uh, you know, provide for more opportunity. But anyway, I think people are very squeamish. And then security advisors stop people from, from, ta from getting as close. But I, people are squeamish. Like from, from, I remember when Lindsay Adari, was a fantastic photographer, in her picture of, the, of that, um, that very powerful picture when the, the family was killed by a by an, uh, bombardment in, was it Kiev? I can't remember, in, yeah. in Ukraine. I mean, she had to fight to get that picture on the front page. She had to fight, and she practically apologized for having that 
picture on the front page. But and I fight every day of my life because I've been at Channel 4 News for a long time, more than two decades. And we used to show stuff that we do not show anymore. Uh, we used to show much more graphic imagery than we do now. And I looked back Snow's early reporting from El Salvador, when you time in the early 80s. There was, this was when he was with ITV News, and there were pictures of a mass grave and vultures and all the bodies. We would never in 100 million years show that now. We would never show that. Now, you can argue that we shouldn't show it, that it's, you know, that it was too graphic, it was upsetting. You know what? Half the reporting I do, I want you to be upset. That is why I am reporting this shit, so that you get upset. Yes, exactly. It should be distressing. Yes. But then, my editor's not here. Um, <laughs> they have a different opinion. But, no, it's yeah. not about advertisers. It's nothing to do with advertisers. It's not, no, it's nothing to do with advertisers. It's about children who are supposed to be protected from things. Um, and it's who should be in bed by that point. Absolutely, they should be. And do, 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 uh, do your son is in bed. My, before, my son is in bed, just to be clear, yeah. Before Channel 4 News? Uh, no, not before Channel To your point about, yeah, you are supposed to be upset. But it's with the it's with the agency of the people involved. If those yeah. girls can make that decision, then it really is dehumanizing to strip them of that agency. If they want the world to know, the world should bloody well know. But surely the irony partly is that people in their teens and twenties are not getting their news from us. Absolutely. Right? They're getting their news raw. Yes, which right. is one of the reasons why opinions of Gaza and other places are so different with respect to the age demographic. Right? There, there's a very, very good, very good point. And there's a, there's a lot of sort of censorship that goes on on mainstream media, if I can use that horrible phrase which I hate, terrestrial television, which there isn't on TikTok or whatever, but a lot of that's to do with context. Um, we're just burbling on. Um, there's some more, I should go to some people at the back. There's a lady who I think is, um, oh, Okay. okay, let's do two or three questions. So there's a gentleman at the back who might be... Is it Steve Crawshaw? Yeah. It is. All right, okay, Steve, and then the lady in front of Steve. Yeah. Um, thank you for an amazing session. Um, you've talked about Sudan. You had that great phrase at the beginning um, of conflict recidivism, and I just want to throw out... You, you, you guys touched a bit on the edges. For reasons on it, justice was... There was this great hope when there was an international criminal court referral for the president of uh, Darfur in general and generally... And then, as you guys have also referred to, partly some of that has been coming back now. Are the things that went wrong? Was justice the answer? Was never was always that kind of thing never the answer in the first place? What is it on that bit? You've talked about corruption, and other things, but on that justice bit, but ju justice, the wrong justice. Do we idealise it too much, or could more have been done on that side? That's a good, we're going to hold that idea, and we're going to go to there's a lady sort of middle row here. Put your hand up again. In red. You had you were wearing red, yes. Sorry, as, as a photographer oh, and right. as someone who now runs a, a communications company, it really concerns me that UN agencies and NGOs are now using photography in quite a manipulative way hmm. to highlight various conflicts. And I'd love to hear, Corinne, what you and Nima, because I know you've worked in similar places to me, how photography is now being used in a way that it wasn't like you did, Corinne. You were purely a voyeur. You were there to witness. And now NGOs and UN agencies are sending in photographers and getting photographs that are there with an agenda. But hang on, what's different about... I mean, they always did. They always took hungry yeah, children now, to raise money and so on. What's but now changed? It's in a much, it's in a, you have the DEC who raised £300 million within three weeks for Ukraine. So the weight of how the media are now using images... And, and, how, and sorry, I, I don't mean to interrogate yeah, you, but I'm trying to understand yeah. the question. So I'm trying to understand, so if we take the DEC... Yeah, uh, appeal which you felt was manipulative about the way it's manipulative in the way that it's now overriding what a photojournalist would have done traditionally with Reuters and gone into a conflict and just stood back right. and taken these images because now papers aren't using photography in the same way as you said channel 4 mm. aren't using those powerful images in the same mm. way because there's a fear that people are going to be too sensitive to these mm. images it concerns me now that we aren't seeing what's really going on because the NGOs are producing what are quite glossy images of the crisis. Right, sort of glossy, sanitised. Yeah, okay, they're not gritty that's, and they're sanitised. Okay, that's really interesting. And we're going to take one more 
Um, I'm going to take it from, it's all from this side. We're going to take this lady and then we'll come to this side. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, following on from the role of photos, I was wondering if there's an overlap between um, photojournalism and war crime evidence gathering, mm. especially with the advent of blockchain. And I know there are mm. organizations like Eyewitness to Atrocity photos in real time, so to speak, as war crimes are happening that they can get verified and used as evidence in criminal trials. And I wondered if... So, yeah, um, that's if a very that's good... In, let's take that one... Anyway, uh, you've got three questions, Corin. You've got the justice. importance of justice, you've got the manipulation of videos, and you've got the role of um, photographs in evidence. Okay, good. Yeah, and just, uh, you know, as a caveat, because I've been out of the profession, some of the thinking on this um, um, I won't have mastered because I haven't been, uh, you know, in on some of the discussions, but I could, I'm certainly happy to share. With respect to justice, um, it's, uh, you know, I think, I, I mean, I worked for Human Rights Watch for 26, 24 years, and I, I still think that the lack of justice for unlawful killings is the biggest driver of recruitment and of war and when, when people lose their loved ones. What feeds um, cycles, it is what feeds recruitment. So it's incredibly important, and again, because um, uh, power is concentrated in so many places in the hands of just a few individuals, um, holding those people accountable um, is just so very, very important. The problem is that sometimes there's a checkmate by the Russias, the Chinas, the funding, the resources, so it's very context specific um, in many ways. And sometimes there's a middle ground where you get somebody out of the way, like Jame in the Gambia, for example, like, he was taken someplace, you know, they should make an island for these people and just sort of like uh, build a wall around that. I've always thought that that would be um, a great yeah. reality TV show. <laughs> yes. You've got so Omar al-Bashir, you've got Jame. Yeah. We're bringing back to life. You've got Anastasio Somoza from Nicaragua. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing? No, it would be. You know, the big, today in the Big Brother house. Yeah, who would? Uh, who on would, the Big Brother island. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. so, so take us, because yeah, so we're actually running out of time. Yeah, fine. And, and then to, to, the, to the other question, I mean, as the wires have been constructed, when you know when John Bureau Chief, you know we must have had five correspondents, and now you've got the AP, for example, in West Africa that has two correspondents, international correspondents, and one of them half the time. I'm exaggerating a little, but very often they're being they're being sent to um, to Ukraine or to or to the Middle East. So you've got one foreign correspondent covering the entire region of West Africa where nearly every country is in but conflict. what about the so, sanitation of images, okay, which so, is what so, the yeah, lady so, there so was my, asking So about. my point on that was is that, is that the news agencies are in, informally subcontracting the gathering of news to, um, to humanitarian um, organizations and think tanks. And that's a problem because I absolutely agree with you, they have an agenda. And, and it's, it, it's hard to identify the agenda because it's couched in, you know, often it's, it's well-meaning and so on. So I think that's a problem, but there needs to be more funding for for, yeah, for and then the final thing is, is photographs as evidence. Yeah, no, it's, they can absolutely be evidence, but the gathering Yeah, but I think that's where the conflict is seen as being a journalist who's gathering evidence of war crimes. Often it's after the fact that those, mm -hmm. that those pictures are used, um, but, you know, they, they, they have and they will continue to be used, you know, in, in criminal tribunals. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a terrible thing has happened, which is that Pramvera told me I had to finish at seven. 15 and 17 and we have neglected this side so you will have to ask our esteemed panel your questions while they're having a drink so I want to so I, I want to thank a couple of people first of all I want to thank Pramvera who organized this event who organizes many events and so I tell you what is a nightmare for Pramvera it's journalists yeah, I'm coming. No, I'm sorry, I can't come. Oh, yeah, I think I can. Oh, no. So she's dealing with that the whole time. Like some people who couldn't come didn't reply and then two days ago suddenly said, Oh, I can come. No, I thought I was yes, just RSVP, yes, to be in the front row and just absorb your wisdom. I didn't realize I was up here. So yes, we want sorry. to thank Frambera. <laughs> the other person we want to thank, and I'm going to make him really embarrassed, is Jonathan Clayton. Yeah. Jonathan. Yeah. So John, he was he was a senior, he very instrumental in the careers of both of these certainly of, of these two people. He made this thing happen, and it's not just the panel; it's that so many people have come here from all sorts of places across the world, and so there is now.
going to be is and drinking, and I'm awfully sorry about that, but that's... You have to have a... Somebody has to give you a, a microphone or nobody will hear you, dear. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, but I was saying on the way here today, I, I remembered that it was 32 years ago that I met uh, Corinne. And at that time, I got a phone call from my then editor who said to me, you could do with an extra photographer in East Africa. And I've got this woman who's... Uh, been blown up in uh, uh, Bosnia, and I, I, want, I, want, I want to blood her slow to the business. And he said, so just send her out on a few, um, you know, wildlife, a few environment <laughs> photographs. And uh, Corinne walked into my office and said to me, Jonty, I've met somebody on the plane, and I, can I go to Somalia tomorrow? No, I, I don't think that's a very good idea. You just you need to settle in. And she came in the next day and said, Johnny, I'm going to South Sudan. <laughs> and, and we never, ever looked back. Uh, that was a, a wonderful time. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you. So, so many issues that we've discussed. We haven't resolved them, but, hey, we'll resolve them. We'll resolve them at the bar. Yeah. So, thank you to Nema El-Bahir, to Mazenboge Big, but I have to say more than anybody, thank you to Corinne Dufkin.